Then one afternoon in early 1991, Eric Carr called me at home. He had just gotten home from the doctor's office. What's wrong, I said. I spat up some blood, so I thought I'd go get checked out, said Eric. Everything cool? I don't know, he said, but I'm really worried. They gave me some kind of scan and found a finger-shaped growth going in and out of my heart. Did they say anything? They said it could be cancer. Nah, don't worry about it, I said. Everything always seems worse than it really is. There's no reason to think the worst-case scenario is the one that will happen. The chances that it's serious are so small, and even if it's cancer, you'll get it taken care of. Unfortunately, a few days later, he called me again. It really is cancer, Eric told me. Worse still, it was an extremely rare form of cancer. The number of cases of heart cancer every year is in the single digits. But I still thought everything would be okay. He left L.A. for a hospital in New York City, and Gene and I flew out to be with him during his open-heart surgery. As far as I understood it, they took part of his heart out and then reconstructed it with what was left. Not long afterwards, we were asked to record God Gave Rock and Roll to You for the movie Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, with Bob Ezrin producing, trying to capture some Destroyer-era magic and erase the memory of the elder. Eric desperately wanted to work on the song, but he was still very frail. You have to pay attention to your health now, I told him, whether that means recuperating on a tropical island or just resting and focusing on yourself. If I knew then what I know now, I never thought this might be his last chance to perform. I would have let him play, but at the time, I was sure he would beat the odds. So Eric Singer played that session, though Eric Carr came to L.A. and sat behind the drums for the video shoot. He had lost all his hair from the cancer treatment and had to wear a massive wig to replicate his natural puffball. He played like a man possessed during the video shoot, duplicating Eric Singer's parts in take after exhausting take. God Gave Rock and Roll to You came out really well, and we decided to try to make another album with Bob Ezrin. When Bob is in top form, he's hard to beat, and I think he wanted to prove something. He, too, was embarrassed about The Elder, and he wanted to buckle down and create a hard-edged, quality album. Hot in the Shade had been a hodgepodge. It was obvious the band was fragmented. If Gene was going to re-engage and we could get back to doing what we did well, I was all for it. We told Eric Carr that we were going to record an album without him. We assured him we would pay all of his bills and keep his insurance going. I reiterated that in the grand scheme of things, the band mattered little. He had to focus on doing whatever he could to get well without compromise. Bob brought in a bunch of drummers to rehearse with us as we started working on Revenge. We played with Ainsley Dunbar for a while, who'd done stints in Journey, Whitesnake, and the Jeff Beck Group, among many others. He was a great classic English drummer, but he just didn't fit. At some point, we brought Eric Singer back. Whether you work in a band or at a factory or in any other kind of job, you have to work together with other people, and that connection affects the overall quality of the work as well as the atmosphere. As fate would have it, Eric Singer fit perfectly. He really was replacing Eric Carr and Kiss, at least for a few months in the recording studio. Throughout it all, I never considered the possibility that Eric Carr might die. I figured he'd be weak for a long time, that the status quo would go on and on. That was how I insulated myself and protected myself against the worst-case scenario. I was wrong. That fall of 1991, as we worked in L.A., I got a call from my friend, Bob Held, in New York. What he was trying to tell me was confusing. Eric Carr had suffered a stroke. The cancer had spread to his brain. He'd been found in his apartment after calling 911. When the emergency responders showed up, Eric was already unconscious, so they paged through his address book and randomly chose someone to call, which turned out to be Bob. But from that moment on, we couldn't get any information. His parents wouldn't talk to me. I called daily to no avail. I didn't understand why nobody would talk to me, or to Gene for that matter. A few weeks later, on November 24, 1991, my assistant called me and said, Eric is dead. I called Gene and told him the news. It was shocking, partly because we hadn't been able to get any information about his situation. Gene and I flew to New York for Eric's funeral. 
It was an open casket funeral, which was ghastly. The body in the casket, which was holding a set of drumsticks, didn't look like Eric. It didn't look like a human being. It looked like a mannequin. Eric's girlfriend, a Playboy playmate he'd been with for several years, briefly took the drumsticks out of the casket for some reason, and Eric's fingers moved as she did. The scent of flowers was overwhelming. You could barely breathe. But I could also smell hostility all around us, people bristling at our presence. Peter and Ace were there. Peter, who everyone knew resented and disliked Eric, tried to tell me that Eric had been calling him all the time. Nothing seemed to make sense. Eric's girlfriend was also filled with anger at me and Jean. It turned out that Eric had painted us as the bad guys. He said we'd booted him out of the band and didn't support him, which simply wasn't true. Everyone there seemed to have the impression that Eric had been cut off, but he hadn't been cut off. Once we told him we were going to record Revenge, he cut himself off from us. I didn't feel like the bad guy, and it was strange to be treated that way. During the service, it was as if a switch had been thrown inside me, and I started sobbing uncontrollably, just bawling my eyes out. In the wake of Eric Carr's death, I continued to spend a lot of time wondering whether I had handled things correctly. Though I thought I had made the best choices at the time, I began to realize I'd been wrong. We had cut Eric off in perhaps the worst way, by denying him what mattered to him most, his place in KISS. That had been lost on me while we continued to do everything we thought was important, everything we thought we could and should do. It was wrong to keep Eric from the thing he loved most, what for him was a lifeline, KISS. And I should have seen that since the band functioned the same way for me and I wasn't even sick. I should have known. Chapter 48 A few months later in January 1992, Pam 